What if we're in a matrix and the only difference between a host and a guest is linear thinking? When I first heard that, I believe it was Marshall McLuhan, had come up with this idea that when man advanced his language from icons that mean things, right? So you want to say dog. So you show a picture of a dog. You want to say house. So you show a picture of a house. That when we changed from that, because we realized, oh my gosh, you have to create a symbol for every single thing that exists in reality that you can conceive of. We came up with an alphabet and a vocabulary. Regardless if you read right to left, left to right, top to bottom, or otherwise, the assertion was, is as soon as man took time to decipher symbols known as letters, known as an alphabet, into words, which were a vocabulary, he gained linear thought. Now, it could be said that since everyone can read, everyone has linear thought, and I wouldn't disagree. And I've mentioned this a few times on the show, in various places. But I'm starting to notice that we all know that social media, especially cell phones in general, and the short attention span, is hurting human beings. What I don't think we understand is the specificity of that damage to the human mind. Now, one could say, wow. My wife, my husband, my kid, they used to be able to sit and listen, sit and watch a television show, sit and basically be bored for a second, and then take that boredom and turn it into something productive, go create something. And now they just stare on their phone, stare on their phone. If the phone is put down for 60 seconds, boy, they got to have it back in their hand. If they ever get bored, they have to pick up the phone. It's a satiation. You're never to be bored. It's like I always say, climate change has got everybody thinking that everybody deserves 73 degree weather that's sunny. You should never have a blizzard. You should never have a lot of rain that creates flooding. You should never have an earthquake or a tornado or a hurricane. You are entitled to perfect weather constantly. If there's any bad news, unlike for centuries, for millennia, where maybe man would blame a god in the past, because man loves that part, right? They've got something to blame. Not realizing that that blame game is going to turn into the most uniform tyranny that they have ever experienced in their lives. A carbon taxation system that's going to control how much they get to turn on their air conditioner, how many kids they have. The poor are going to become depopulated while the rich have as many kids as possible. The linear mind. Well, what would we can contrast that with? What would we contrast the linear mind with to basically see if we have something else? And I would say the now mind. Now, there's a lot of like success groups out there that say, hey, you're, you're planning too much and you're not taking care of the now. I'm not refuting that process at all. But that's usually within the context of a linear mind to understand how to use the power of now. Meaning, get off your ass and do whatever the hell it is that you've got on that list for your future because you never get any time back, right? Time is the most exclusive commodity you have access to. And even though I believe we live forever and that reincarnation is definitely the game, perhaps back into humans for a little while, maybe into some other life force, maybe you become an insect, maybe you've already been all those lower life forms, that would make sense to me. And you're simply advancing your soul's matrix Perhaps you're getting better at combining your soul and a body together so you have more faculties. People who have intuition might be very old souls because they simply remember how to reach into the universe from previous lives. But the now mind is a huge problem as it relates to what I believe to be the new thing, the new social media degradation of the human mind. Haven't you heard financial experts and economists report year in and year out that the amount of money in a savings account for an individual is basically going down, down, down. And most people under 50 have absolutely no retirement whatsoever. No money for a rainy day. You live paycheck to paycheck. Now, the old-fashioned way this worked was that your parents weren't demonized by social media, television, and movies. And so you had a good relationship with them. It doesn't mean you 
always got along perfectly. But in the end, when you graduated from whatever schooling was available in whatever century that you were living in, you would inherit your parents' land, business. They might have some money set aside. It was completely normal when I was a kid, meaning a young child in the 70s, for your parents to pay for weddings. You know, the the um, father's or the groom's parents would pay for one set of benefits and the the wife's parents would pay for the wedding. You know, the groom is supposed to come up with a house, a ring, all that kind of stuff. Now, rings, of course, we can deprecate because it was the diamond industry that basically made everyone feel like uh, they, they ran all the ads to tell the women that if you're not given a gigantic ring, well, he doesn't really love you. That's a whole different shallow problem that was hatched on everyone. Men bought into it as well. But the now mind, if you really want to start putting some physical attributes to it, is that an individual no longer sees the world the way that you see it if you have a linear mind. What would be some of the attributes of a linear mind? They'd be a clean household. Because you would see the overall spectrum of what a household is. A household is an interesting analogy because it it has so many elements to it that have to be kept clean. A bedroom, a bathroom, a front room, a kitchen, and all the other little closets and other little rooms where knickknacks are kept. Your cleaning supplies in general should be in the same place. You can always find them when you need to do it. And the linear mind, although they may not completely enjoy the process of cleaning up a house constantly, they know how to do it. But a now mind can't see that. If you want an analogy of how the now mind sees the world, think about wearing horse blinders. Those little shades that go on both sides of the horse head. What's that do? Well, the horse can't see... It's peripheral vision. Peripheral vision is the most powerful vision you have. It has a higher frame rate than your straight on vision. I've said this several times in episodes, but if you want to do a little test to prove this to yourself and you have a ceiling fan in your house, lay on your bed, stare up at the ceiling fan, stare right at the blades and they will be blurry. Now turn your head 90 degrees, either left or right, and look at those blades with your peripheral vision. Suddenly, the blur goes away and they're completely in focus. I would suggest that the reason why this is the case is that peripheral view, your flanks, your left and right flank, which goes back about 220 degrees around your head. So if dead center is straight ahead, you're going to go 100 degrees in either direction, back from center. This allows you to see predators coming up against you. It allowed us to hunt and to survive the hunt. Why do they tell boxers to stare in the chest of their opponent? Because their peripheral vision will watch the arms, and it's hard to move a chest really, really quickly. But you can bob a head really fast. You can fake a punch really fast. There's that old game whack-a-mole, and it's called all kinds of different things, but it's that carnival game where the five little rats are popping out of the holes, and you have this big cushiony plunger. If you want to win that game every single time, my father and I figured this out when I was a teenager. Stare at the center wood of that game and don't take your eyes off the center wood. Never, ever, ever stare at one of the rats. And you will see every single one pop up and you will hit every single one of them. And the only competition you have in the room is someone else who's figured that out and you have to hit it first. We used to win dozens and dozens of stuffed toys. My father was a photographer. Oftentimes we'd have kids that come up to get their portraits taken. And we just give away the toys that we want at the local at the local amusement park called Worlds of Fun outside of uh, Kansas City. The now mind is causing failure. The now mind takes an entrepreneur that would otherwise succeed, and it pigeonholes their brain. How does a business work when you're an entrepreneur? Well, it depends on how you're running your business. But let's say you have a service-oriented business. You provide a service, and the service takes a little while to complete. It's not like you're a plumber and you're going to go in one day, get the money, finish it on the first day, and then everyone's happy. Let's say you're in construction or something. You're a painter of a house. It's going to take a few days to paint that house, but you like that down payment. The down mind can't see the full spectrum of the project. They get the down payments. They take a lot of down payments with schedules in the future to paint the house, to do the construction. And they go and spend that money. 
on rent or some other thing that's not very productive. Then they find themselves financially upside down. They're overbooked because they don't have linear thought process. When I first moved to California, I worked for a little company. And all the guys that worked for the main guy said, uh, yeah, this guy can never say no to a client. And we're completely overwhelmed because he can't say no. I happen to think that was a now mind breaking his business. Now, he ended up staying in business for damn near probably uh, at least 25 years. Probably 30 years because he was a business before I ever worked for him. So he did well in the end. But life is a lot harder these days. Mistakes are a lot more powerful in your life these days. Getting financially upside down is increasingly more difficult to get right side up. And they are playing games with everything that our life is made out of. So we need to be as astute as humanly possible to survive what they're throwing at us such that we don't feel the pain. We don't feel the impact of what they're doing. College students are compromised by a lot of advice they even get from their parental units, right? The parents will say, well, college is more of an experience than an education. There couldn't be worse advice for a child than to say something like that. The parent might be going into debt. The child might be going into debt. And to treat that education and that debt, unlike any other debt you would treat in your life, is absolutely ridiculous. Case in point, let's say that you were an inventor and you invented something and you sold a few copies of it and now you managed to get on the show Shark Tank and you walk in there and you ask for $150,000 and let's say you take it seriously. You know that it's hard to make money. If it was easy to make money, you wouldn't be asking other people for it. It's the basis of capitalism. You have to ask someone else to capitalize your business because you don't have that money. Now you're sharing parts of your company, ownership of your company. It's a loss to you no matter what. Could end up being a gain if you sell enough product. But you wouldn't go into Shark Tank unless you were an idiot and think that you're for sure going to walk out with the deal. And that's because you know you have to convince one of five people or more in the Shark Tank that your business is worthwhile. But when that business is nothing more than an education and the Student loans, well, they kind of can feel free if you have a now mind. You'll take on all that debt. You might not be getting a very good education. And if your parents or friends convince you to compromise the very institution of your education, let alone pick a degree that is actually attached to a job, you'll end up with no job and tons of debt that you can't get forgiven no matter what. You can't run away from it. It's a scam. We all know that. The colleges don't have to produce degrees that actually produce jobs. They just have to convince you that a college diploma will always get you work. And that's no longer the case anymore at all. I've been in think tanks with some of the most amazing people you could ever get your hands on. Guests to the think tank were, are far more powerful and amazing than the people that are actually part of the guest or part of the actual think tank themselves. And I've heard from the top I would say most secretive government employees of organizations we're not too fond of and some of the top business people in the world say that college degrees are no longer what they look for when they interview a candidate at all. It doesn't hurt if you have a good one, that's for sure. So if you're smart and you pick a good degree and you get good grades and you graduate, they like that. But there's a lot of ways to get in those institutions nowadays without those pieces of paper. I am not a college graduate myself. But I have a portfolio that, you know, young engineers would be lucky to have. Because I have an extremely linear mind. When you talk to someone about something that's like a truth movement thing, whatever category it might be. What they might call deep conspiracy of something, maybe like the moon missions. Or something about politics. You'll talk to people exactly like yourself and you'll have no problem trading information back and forth because you have a linear mind and so do they. But sometimes you'll run up against a person where you're trying to talk to them and you'll start seeing deer eyes within just a few syllables out of your mouth. And that's because they have a now mind. And at no point in your conversation are they ever going to metamorphosize and create a linear mind. I'm actually convinced now that people are born with linear minds 
and some people are born with now minds, and it's virtually next to impossible to transition. I think you can transition, but just like everything in life, you have to want to transition. You have to feel the pain of your lack of linear thinking. You have to see the consequence of having no linear thinking and want to change that. It was a Dale Carnegie. I've told you this story recently in the last year here, last six months. He was so successful that the Senate thought he was cheating. And so they brought him in for the intense interrogation on the Senate floor. And they got done auditing every one of his businesses and they figured out that he was legit. But they couldn't figure out how this man was so wealthy and so powerful and just continuing to grow leaps and bounds. And he told them, he says, the reason why I'm more successful than you guys is that I can concentrate on a subject matter for five minutes or more at a time. And they, of course, jumped into their I'm so offended mode, angry. That's the only real emotion that exists in there. Remember, being offended is being angry and you want a prize for it. That's what being offended is all about. It's extorting something out of another human being. But Carnegie was smart, and he gave them a test, of which has not been revealed in any of the history books, but he gave the Senate a test to see if they could think about something for five minutes. The story goes that every single one of them failed. Then he walked out of the room and dropped the mic. We need to be Dale Carnegie as much as possible. We need linear minds. We need to be able to know what we can do with the time and resources that we have. The older you get, you might factor in the amount of energy you have in your day and then build a plan and execute against it. I do a lot of different things all week, all month, all year. Probably four things that are completely, utterly polar opposites of each other. I like it because it, it stimulates different parts of my brain. I program really intense mobile devices. Okay, so that's my logic mind. Then I do a lot of 3D, which has a lot of creativity because you have to figure out how you want to make something happen because you're supposed to use the few, fewest amount of points to make something occur. And then there's all the artistry of lighting it, that kind of thing. I create shows for you guys, very linear recordings where I can see what I'm going to say probably five to ten minutes out from when I'm talking. That's why when I get interrupted, I can lose a gem of a point I was going to make. Or if I'm trying to make too many points at time, at one particular time, I'm losing some of the children along the way. And I listen to it back and I cringe because I remember this great point that I should have re-recorded and inserted the other element into the recording. But I forgot. I overwhelm my circuitry. I write screenplays. Well, that's a completely creative, you are one with the universe thing. I have to relax my mind, pull the story out of the universe, listen to my characters, watch what I'm doing from uh, scene to scene, how it's all flowing, make sure it all seems logical. When I get into the dialogue of it all, I have to make sure that the dialogue makes sense for the character, that I don't write the same dialogue type for character A and write the same, you know, as I do with character B. Because then it sounds like, oh, this is one person trying to pretend to be a bunch of different characters. My agent will pick up on that in two seconds and they'll flush the the script down the drain and not want to work with me anymore. I practice probably without direct intent at my linear mind. I stretch it. I push it. When someone talks to me about this subject matter in real life, we get into a conversation that goes forever. And I always talk them to death. They always, they're panting. They've got to go. Their, their wife is look, waiting for them. They're getting, literally, we had this question. I had this happen to me the other day where my buddy's phone's blowing up. His wife's texting him. He's at the cigar lounge. It's 2.30 in the morning. He's like, oh, I got to go. I got to go. But I love this conversation. There's benefits to this process. But the biggest benefit of all is your peace of mind. Because again, why are we so sort of, irritated at what the globalists are trying to do to our world. We know that the central thing that they're trying to do is gain control. More and more control over our life. There's a lot of brilliant people out there with solutions. Perhaps a now mind actually has a really cool solution, but we can't get that tiny focused myopic vision of theirs to focus on the problem long enough 
to actually find the solution that's in their subconscious or something that they would just calculate in two seconds and solve the problem because they have to pick up their cell phone because they have to look across the room. They're feeling irritated that it's taking time to understand a concept. So when someone walks in the room, they immediately start engaging that other person right in the middle of your conversation. They have to do it because they're hurting because they have a now mind. Ma Bell, who made the, uh, when I was a kid, owned all the telephones. I've said this a few times, but they had a seven-digit phone number for everyone in small towns. You didn't need to know the uh, area code. All of Los Angeles had the same area code. All of Boston had the same area code. New York was big enough. They had a couple. And even if you had a couple, you were okay. Well, he's inventory. He's, he's, uh, he's 805. When the pagers came on board, when the cell phones came on board, we all had to have area codes. And now every city's got several area codes. There's just so many people. Now no one knows anyone else's phone number. Because there's too much to store in your brain. It went from a seven-digit number to a ten-digit number for everyone that you know. Well, Ma Bell did a psychological test on human beings and found that seven... Remember, phone numbers in the 40s were like four to five numbers with like a, a letter in front of it. They would often remember the letter by putting a, a word in front of it. We are at a point now where there's so much information coming in via these devices. There's no more room left. Because we have to say that if there was a gauge, a gradient, extreme left, let's just say, was a linear mind. Extreme right is the, is the now mind. They're absolute in those two categories. There's every gradient of the human mind between those two points. Someone could be directly in the center. They're half now, half linear. Well, let's just say, 50 years ago, the gradient was really strong towards the left. Most of humanity, without all these digital devices, television, movies, things to preoccupy themselves with, radio eventually, right? People knew how to read books to entertain themselves. They knew how to tell a story because Grandpa used to tell the story. Why could they tell the story again in full detail, maybe even embellish it even further? Because their brain was actually configured that way, and it wasn't distracted by all the other technology that's out there. I think a lot of incompatibilities between human beings derive from the now mind and the linear mind, both professionally and personally. I'll give an example of a professional categorization. A now mind employee is a good employee. They do something now. They manufacture something. They do something, perhaps data entry. But they have this thing that they do, and they do it. And they do it well. And they deserve a good paycheck, especially if they're efficient at it. But then you have something called a manager, a director, a vice president, a CEO. Those individuals have to be linear thinkers because they have to look at the overall strategy and vision of the company. You have a lot of resources on your hand that are costing you a lot of money. You have to see the big picture. And because estimating your sales is always important, estimating your growth is always important, figuring out strategies to work with the economy that you have is very, very important. You have to see linear time. I've experienced people that are very now thinkers becoming managers, and they're usually not very good managers. They're not bad people. They're just not very good managers. What's a manager that's a now thinker not do? They don't manage their employees at all. The employees can be goofing off, staring at the floor. They don't even notice. If an employee does something fantastic, well, they often won't acknowledge it. They won't say, good job. They never get to know their employees. Hey, how you doing? Well, what are you doing this weekend? Oh, that's cool. Are you into that kind of thing? Wow, when did you get into that thing? Wow, why do you like that? You know, get to know a person. A linear thinker sees each employee as a timeline. They see them from when they were little kids to whenever they're meeting them right now. And they know that they chose this career, usually, because something happened to them. Maybe it's serendipitous. Maybe it's intentional. It's good to know why people tick, because then you can motivate them. The more linear you are, the more success you have. Now, over the last, uh, say, six years, we had 
a phrase introduced to our lexicon, which I think is great. It's called 4D chess. Now, 4D chess is the extreme of 3D chess. Imagine you can play chess and you play it well. Stanley Kubrick was really big on chess. Arnold Schwarzenegger is a big chess player because they know it stimulates their linear mind. Stanley Kubrick would see a movie, you know, all at the same time. Every single scene, how it all works together, how the actors have to perform to pull off the vision that's inside of his head. Then in the editing room, he gets the beauty and the privilege of putting it all together. And then smithing every single aspect of the experience from the sound to the cinematography to the lines, to the performances. You know, he was famous for taking 40 to 50 takes on someone. One actor had to do 160 takes. He has options for smithing how the vision went into the human mind because he was playing 40 chess, at least. When we first start driving our cars, we're very now. Mirror, rear view mirror, side mirror. How fast am I going? Look at the speedometer. Am I shifting right? How do I par park, angle park? How do I parallel park? It's all now, now, now. But you know that as you got better as a driver, these things become ubiquitous, don't they? You can drive down the street without looking at the speedometer once. And you know that, you know, if you just generally match the speed of everyone around you, you're good. If you've got an open highway, well, that's when you might start looking at your speedometer. But you're also thinking of a linear time event in your life, which is called getting a ticket. You might study the terrain and study the state that you're in. In California, they have to pace you. They have to get behind your car and drive the same speed as you. They got a big camera to prove it. But where I come from in Kansas, every open highway, they can use radar. And they'll just zap you. Well, there's certain terrain that goes up and down and up and down. And as long as you can go down a slope, you don't see a police officer. You can take a chance. The highway patrolman won't find you. You're thinking in linear formats. The fun thing about the Westworld example that I opened with stems from something I've kind of manifested through episodes about the Matrix. This, it's a game I'm playing. I don't think necessarily this is true, but I also could see it being true very easily, which is that some of us are real, and some of those folks out there are simply props to challenge us. When you go to prison in the United States, it's all private for profit for most for the most part, and they've configured prisons to torture you. They know that they don't protect you when you take a shower. They know that they've put you in a hostile situation, and based on their philosophies, it's sort of a one-size-fits-all torture for all people. You might have nonviolent offenders being put in an extremely violent situation. It's not a punishment that matches the crime. But it's a one-size-fits-all, who cares, I'm making money off your body. And a lot, of time, a lot of cases, the prisons arrange for you to catch more cases, working with the cartels inside there, to set you up. They threaten your life if you don't hurt another person. Well, the guards are waiting at that other person. They're not going to let you hurt that other person at all, or at least not much. And you're not going to get hurt that much either. Maybe you get freaked out. You're getting PTSD no matter how it works. But you have a six-month case, you're doing your time, you walk over to hurt this person because someone threatened your life, you feel like you're going to get killed in prison for a six-month sentence, you, you agree to go do this thing, they grab you and they give you two more years. They make profit for two more years off your body. Well, imagine you take that sort of scenario. We're here for a reason. We're not quite sure what that reason is. Sometimes it feels like bliss, right? Sometimes life feels like heaven. And other times it's like, man, am I in a prison? I didn't do anything to deserve this economic collapse. All my money's gone. All the stock options I had in that company are gone. My 401k disappeared. You wonder sometimes why things happen to you. Now, what's interesting is we also know the more that we get older, time typically fixes all. It, that's a very fine line there, I should say. There's a very fine line within that statement. There's two ways to view it in the way that I've seen it my entire life. You can do what's called joining them, which is to capitulate down your freedoms and your happiness and say, well, they're not going to let me do this anymore, so I have to just give up. And sometimes you decide to fight however you possibly can. You try to be fair. 
You try to act like perhaps you think your creator would want you to act. But now what if a giant element to the world is nothing more than noise? Individuals that are simply in your life to challenge you. And they could be in bed with you. They could be your boss. They could be your employee. They could be the person walking down the street. The game is potentially played that let's see how you react. When I write film, and I got taught by a beautiful teacher named Robert McKee, M-C-K-E-E. He is the best teacher for teaching you how to write a screenplay. He's got a book called Story, which if you just get on audio, he reads it to you. He's an amazing uh, auditorial person. He's incredible. He teaches you that a hero is defined by their decisions under pressure. And he's absolutely correct. And I'm sure he didn't invent that, but he brought it to me. We are those heroes. And how do we perform under pressure? Well, now imagine without even saying anything, without giving you an example, you know that you can evaluate that argument from a now mind. And you can anticipate how, well, I would say what quality that response might be. Regret might actually come from a person who is thinking in the now. We've all been there. Trust me. I'm an expert when I was younger, getting all flustered. But as you get older, the linear mind seems to creep up on you as you sort of get, well, at least from my generation, you put down the phone more and more. The more you even launch Facebook or Instagram or whatever the hell you're looking at, you just want to puke in your mouth because you're like, ugh, my life has turned into this. This is what is my entertainment. You turn on Netflix one more time and you're like, oh my God, am I really going to just take the time I have here on earth and flush it down the drain? Now, sometimes shows have a lot of, you know, educational arcs in there for you and and they're very valuable to you. Like I would say Westworld is an amazing show to watch if you're interested in the Matrix. Carnival is an amazing show. I've just watched it the sixth time. Still seeing new stuff I'd ever saw before. And I'm trained to see that stuff. It's incredibly multidimensional. It's 4D chess. My goal from the very beginning was to take whatever little teeny tiny things I've learned in this world or big things and transfer it to audio at a minimum and give those little nooks and crannies to you so that maybe, maybe you can avoid them. Any tools that I've created for myself, you're able to use them. And just gain control over your life. And let's just think about what that might mean. Let's just say God came and talked to you. Or God left you, let's just say, a wand from like Harry Potter with a little message in it, right? The message says, with this wand, you can change your life any way you want. Here's the code word that you say. Swing it. Yours truly, with love, God. What would you do? How would you change your life? I would say this, to the degree that you would have a gigantic list of things that you would change, mm, that's probably an indicator that you should probably do that with, uh, even without the wand. Start thinking about how you might uh, make a few alterations, right? Because you want to be good, you want to be fair, and you want to do no harm to others. So follow common law, basically. If you have a little fine-tuning things you would change, it actually might get more exciting. It's a small thing that you would change. Well, you know what? I sleep in a little too too long. Or I go to bed a little too early and I still got another hour of time in my day. Why don't I take advantage of that? Well, with a now mind, I don't think you would ever recognize what to do with such a thing. There would be no plan. You know, there's the old saying, failing to plan is planning to fail. I so believe in that and I, I more profess that now in my own life than ever before. Now, it might be that young people are obviously born into a survival mode that is the now mind. They're not necessarily hosts in the matrix, right? But a lot of us are looking at cell phones being handed to children, especially at restaurants and public places, because the parents are like, here, fuck off, you know? I don't want to deal with you anymore. I'm so glad this cell phone just keeps my kid completely happy. If you do it, well, just know that you can stop. But imagine this. Let's just do another analogy. What if the other solution that you could do is to bring a mallet with you? And every single time you take your kid to a restaurant, because you don't want to parent and teach the child how to behave and make that a thing to do. 
You just hit them on the head and it knocks them completely out for 20 minutes at a time. If they wake up and they're still being a little pain in the ass, you just hit them on the head again. Now, hopefully you realize that you're damaging your child's physiology. You're giving them concussions. It might end up causing them all kinds of neurological disorders. You'll probably end up killing them after a couple dinners. And so you wouldn't do that, right? You would be like, man, why would I? That's so stupid to even say that, man. I would never hit my kid just to make them get quiet. But what if giving them a cell phone, a tablet to entertain them, destroys their brain way, way worse than the mallet? At least the mallet will kill them and free their body uh, from their soul so they can go get reborn in a better situation at a better time when someone doesn't give them a digital device to pacify them. Nope. Giving them a digital device ensures that they stay a now mind, inferior to the rest of the world that has a linear mind. They will always be controlled by a George Soros, by a Klaus Schwab. Always. Why? Because those dudes are linear, and your child's not. All the politicians who are bastards in the world, all the business people that are bastards in the world, are all linear thinkers. Every single one of them. And they're damn good at it. The only difference is, I think they've realized, whether or not they call it the now mind people, which I'm sure they don't, they think that we're cattle when it comes time to send our children to war and they train your kid to be a now machine. Special Forces, Delta, Navy SEALs, those are the linear minds that show themselves to basic training. Plus, they have to have good physiology to complement that. But that's why they're allowed to be in the theater of war autonomously, controlling gigantic regions of diplomatic relations with other countries, because they have a linear mind. The cattle get slaughtered. The sheep just follow. The sheep is the normal citizen of the world that doesn't go to war. Now, there's been plenty of soldiers that have gone in, and they know they were young, and they went to war and they did some things maybe they're proud of, maybe some things they're not proud of. Sorry, we got cars driving by outside. But they start to grow the linear mind naturally in their early 20s. The government and military understand that a, a person inside a theater of war starts growing a conscience at the age of 23 on average. So they want the kids to, that are going to tear up cities on behalf of the bankers to be between 19 and 23. Now, sometimes guys love it, and they're useful, and they'll continue to be employed for those theaters of war. But you've seen situations in history, and it's dramatized in movie after movie, where individuals follow what they've been told, no matter what, at the complete expense of their soul, of someone else's uh, life getting obliterated. Now, before I uh, paint such a dark picture, I need to say that I really do refuse to believe in a hell as been defined by man. But I definitely think there's a little resting spot where you'll get a chance to think about what you were doing. But I also think once you leave your body, all of the paradigms that controlled you, maybe embarrassed you about your decision-making process, they die with the body. And your soul returns to the universe and understands the beauty of everybody getting along. Competition and competitiveness. I did an episode on this a long time ago. It has to do with the now mind as well. I'm actually pretty opposed to competitive nature, sports, competitive, anything. Because competitiveness means that someone has to lose and someone wins. The more people that are in the contest, the more you have losers. In every single sport in America, there's one champion ring. Now, obviously, the, the team that gets to the finals also gets a ring, but one team gets the champion ring, right? And that means that every single team that lost, they got nothing except the last two teams. Now, obviously, you're proud to get to the finals no matter what, but it can't be configured in our world. It can, but this is the way that they think. The now mind doesn't see a scenario where everyone can win. The competitiveness is simply, we were really good today. Hey, if we keep playing this game, you're going to win eventually, too. If you stay in the game and you're not a very good player, it's almost mathematically against that you won't become a better player. When I used to teach art for kids, 
I teach anybody art no matter what. I tell you this. Let's say you're an illustrator or a painter or something, right? No matter how much you draw and you don't like what you draw, you will always get better the more that you draw. Now, maybe within a particular session, you get tired and everything you create is a little bit less than the first thing you drew that particular day. But give it 24 hours, 48 hours, 72 hours. If you come back with that pen, that pencil, that paintbrush, you will get better every single time. And if you keep at it, you eventually start entertaining people with what you create. It's not important at all that someone else feel bad that they can't do what you do on the first day. It might be that for whatever reason, you're a natural. And what you can do at 10 years old, a 20-year-old can't do. But there's a difference. It's mathematical and has nothing to do with competitiveness. The 20-year-old simply hasn't done it as much as you have. The story of Tiger Woods is very, very well known. His father pushed him on a golf green when he was a teeny little kid. Well, of course, by the time he was in his late teens and early 20s, he was a master at the stuff he had done over and over and over again. Because the very function of driving and putting was muscle memory for him. He got so good at it, he put nuance into it. He had intuition. He started figuring out golf greens. He would immediately know a strategy the second he looked at a golf green that he never played on before. After a couple games on it, he'd figure out what the real anomalies are, and he would win a green jacket over and over and over again. Now, some of you might have failed in life, and you think, well, you know, I failed once, and that really inspired me to get better. So competitive nature actually works. If it works for you, I would never deny you a tool that works for you. For me, I didn't have to... Think about Michael Jackson crying in his dressing room because Prince came out with another album that hit number one, or vice versa. When I want to be entertained with the style of music that is Michael Jackson, I listen to Michael Jackson music. It makes me feel a certain way. When I listen to Prince music, it makes me feel a completely different way. Both of them are wins because I have multiple areas in my brain that enjoy the two different styles. If there's one thing we know about the world right now is that there's a strategy going on, right? They are strategizing Agenda 21 into our life like crazy. They've infiltrated every single position in everyone's government that isn't elected with just money. They just put the money in, that person gets into that position. Once they get a few people in a position that can make a decision to bring someone on board that's also part of the club, they get straight in, they take their desk, And they do whatever the emails tell them to do. Thus, they get to take over the world because they're strategizing. And that's just layer one. Layer two is really throwing elections and all that kind of stuff, right? It's intense. So how much can humanity afford to be living in the now mind without a linear process? If you want to know how well your country is going to fare in the next decade, well, just look around the world. Interact with people and find out, geez, uh, that person seems to be, I can see their tonsils because their mouth's hanging open. Their eyes seem to be focused at a 60,000 foot stare. I can't have a conversation for more than a minute with these people because they just can't contemplate it. See, the thing is, when you're a big sports fan, what's interesting about it is there's rarely an intellectual depth to that human being. Another way of saying that is there's very little linear mind capability. What's also interesting about the now mind is that they know how to complain just as much as linear mind people, but they have very few strategies to deal with those issues. For instance, I had a guy worried about the economy the other night. His only way of talking about it was to talk through the news talking points that he got from his favorite news show. He was uh, telling us that he was getting these um, telemarketing calls and emails from a particular political party that was saying the other political party was going to raid Social Security in America. It is the most hilarious, trite threat that comes from the other side. And they're trying to raise money on that threat. 
that threat comes by every single campaign, every single group that's not in office, that wants to be in office. They threaten the other side. Even if they're in office, they'll say that. But my friend can't apply his own knowledge. But what's interesting is he had the wherewithal late at night to stop me and ask me the question. What do you think about that? He's sort of edging into his linear mind. He's not an idiot, very successful, fully retired. But after I gave him my take on that, and he went, oh yeah, you're right, because he's much older than me. He's probably 15 years older than me. He was like, yeah, you're right. He couldn't remember that he had seen that formula, I don't know, 50 times in his lifetime, because he's living in the now mind. What was he doing just before he asked me the question? He was extremely worried about a basketball game. Interesting, right? But I've also found a very interesting difference in sports. The faster pace the sport, and the more that the sport scores over and over and over again, the dopamine pops, the more now-minded the fans are. If a game has strategy and is a little bit slower, I find that I am in a room with people that can have extended conversations. Now, there's a lot of sports out there in non-American countries that probably fit this bill. So you just apply that to what you know about it. But in America, we have a game called baseball. And I have found absolutely no no problem finding people with PhDs watching baseball. It's a wild thing. The people that hate baseball love all the really quick-firing sports. The repetitive strategies, the very, I don't know, let's just say maybe a particular game of basketball might have 20 things that can happen. In baseball, there'd be 60 things that can happen. The nuances of a pitch, of a hit, of a fielding play, all the different little rules that that come into play. And no one has to act like a baby because somebody touched them on the field, right? I tried to watch soccer the other day, and I'm just utterly, which is called football in the rest of the world. I just couldn't believe that grown men with self-respect watched a game where a bunch of grown men who are obviously very well fit collapse on the ground and act like a fucking baby. And then two seconds later up playing the game like nothing happened to them. Dramatizing like a little girl on stage. I mean, it's absolutely, utterly embarrassing. That's, That's my thought process on that. What you do is what you're good at. Always remember that. If you use your mind, then your mind starts growing, right? That's how you create new neurons in your brain. You stimulate the brain. That's what kicks off cell reproduction inside your neuron net, inside your brain. Don't use it. And they start shriveling up. I mean, seriously, you're not going to use a big part of your brain. Your brain will think it's overgrown itself. And either the circuitry just goes dormant because it's like, man, no one, I got... I got a Maytag man in like 80% of my brain because it's not used. But you have to know this as well. I've said this a few times. When you start using your brain, especially in a new capacity, there's a very interesting phenomenon that happens that you need to be aware of. You will get tired. It's a weird thing. I'm always taking classes online. Always. If I play a game on my mobile device at night, maybe I'm watching a movie or something, and I'm just kind of like, okay, the movie's off to the side, I'm having fun, chuckling at various jokes that are happening in the movie, and I just want to play something on the side. Sometimes I just play stupid things, which are just, I'm building something up in a game, or I play like a a math-challenging game. They give me these crazy diagrams, and it's missing a number. There's all kinds of numbers all over the screen, I'm missing a number, and I have to find the logic in the patterns of numbers on the screen. Well, what's interesting about it is I love these types of games. My father used to buy me Dell Logic books when I was a kid, and I just found that as an app on my Android, by the way. And it's basically a table of information with a paragraph down below. So you get this massive reading comprehension because you're deciphering what data is true in this graph up above. You still sit there and just do that forever. And I wasn't getting tired as a child. But I'll find that if I go into this math sort of pattern game, it's really kind of a Mensa test um, type game on the phone. I can only play about 
maybe three levels and I'm exhausted. When I go into my language courses and I start learning my Arabic, it, uh, it can make me exhausted. It's very difficult to pay attention when you're exhausted. I'm taking a course right now to build games in Unity 3D. It's easy. I completely anticipate the commands before this guy even says, but I get tired. And what's interesting about it is the more challenging the product is, the more tired I get. And so I had to take a step back from that process and go, okay, when do I have my most energy in the day? I have to pay attention. My, my old mentor, Sid Mead, who's passed in 2019, he used to say that he never ate lunch. And he worked 12-hour days. And this guy was an industrial designer, painter. You've seen his stuff in movies like crazy. S-Y-D-M-E-A-D dot com. But he said that lunch made him sleepy. And so he didn't want to eat lunch. Now, as he got into his 70s, he started eating lunch. But that was about it. It took him 50 years of doing the job of industrial designer, movie designer, futurist designer to start eating lunch in the middle of the day. Of course, on a weekend, he'd eat lunch wherever he was. But he managed his time according to his energy level. And so I had to say to myself, okay, if I've come home, taken a shower like I just did, creating these episodes is fun for my brain. It's fluid, gets out a lot of thoughts I've had over the week. Because truth be told, the way these episodes come about is I have a conversation with someone, or I have a thought, and I start, what I do is I, in my mind, I lay down a linear timeline of about an hour. And what I do is I start putting in to this timeline the points I want to make in the timeline. Now, a bunch of stuff happens while I'm recording that I didn't plan. Some of the best gems of anything I've ever said in my life have just happened just while I'm talking to you guys. But I build a foundation and I... I kind of decide, do I have enough information to turn this into an episode? But you have to understand, I've probably got five other timelines stacked in my brain for other episodes. And so as I live throughout the week, I'm stacking stuff and interviewing people to make sure I've got valuable insights that aren't just mine to share with you guys. I'm pushing my brain and pushing my brain every single day. And it's like working out. If you've ever felt the joy of working out, you run, you lift weights, whatever you do. Your muscles are tight when you get into bed. And you're like, man, my chest is so much better than it was two weeks ago. God, why didn't I do this before? You know, you feel that, that extra high after you get done working out. It could be 11 o'clock at night and you lift weights. And all of a sudden you're like, man, I should be really sleeping well. And you get in bed and you're like, your eyes are wide open because your body's like, what else do you want to do, right? You can do that intellectually too. But I've decided, okay, I can't learn Arabic at night. I, if I'm going to do a uh, Unity 3D class, what I've figured out is this. I put my iPad on my chest at night, far enough away from my heart that I don't get a bunch of EMP stuff on me. But uh, I'll watch the episode the night before and watch him write the code and get the theory down. And if I haven't completely memorized it for the next day, when I get back to my desk, launch all the software... I just rewind the episodes. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's I forgot how he said that, you know. And I just get through it when I have my energy levels. Sometimes I have to deal with things that are very complex and they're very challenging and they're not very rewarding, right? I just had to fix a bug that took me five days to fix. It's not a fun thing. Well, I go to my smoke lounge. I pull out a cigar. I smoke on a cigar. It calms me down a little bit while I'm going through this very otherwise very stressful situation. So I avoid the stress and get the job done. I'm telling you these things because you might go, yeah, you're right. I want to you know, increase my linear mind. And you start trying new things that you haven't tried. And you get tired and you're like, oh my God, I don't know if I can even do this. I just want you to know that's the game. And most of the successful people in life either figured it out for themselves by studying how they felt, or they had mentors, which uh, I don't know if I've ever had, that told them this stuff ahead of time. So you can start anticipating things. If you're going to try something new, maybe, maybe you have the most energy in the day in the morning, between 8 and 12. Maybe you're more like me. It's uh, 12 to 5 o'clock. I have the super chunk of energy, right? Put those things that are more complex and new within those envelopes and give it, give it a try. 
The other thing, too, is to subtract out of your mind the paradigms of things that you've learned from other learning institutions or perhaps individuals that taught you things in the past. Case in point, when you went to school as a kid, you got there probably between, probably around 8 o'clock in the morning at least, right, on average. You stayed till, well, my school kept us until 3 o'clock that afternoon. And so you might think, and it's one hour piece, you know, high school, one hour classes all the way till the end of the day with maybe lunch in the middle. Okay. So you might try to recreate such a thing in your household. Well, I'm going to try, I'm going to do this, I'm not going to try, I'm going to do this for one hour. But you're exhausted after 10 to 15 minutes. And the reason why is it's brand new. It's brand new in your head. And so you might take away a failure that day. Gosh, man, I... Maybe I'm too old for this, or blah, blah, blah. It's not really the case. Oh, sure, if you were 18 years old, you might push right through that with no problem. The fascination with what you're doing turns into an addiction, and you get this extra energy because things are happening in front of your face. Typically, in a project, let's just say, I divide up all projects. Now, most of you have heard this, but I just want to share it again because we're on point and it has context here that might actually help you because we're talking now in the second half of this episode about getting you the linear mind that might be very beneficial to you. This will be a little bit different for you by yourself on your own, but there's, there's some truth to this even with a personal project and a personal goal. Now, with something like learning a different language, well, you'll probably learn a different language your whole life if it's not your language, because once you master general conversation, you go to advanced conversation. Once you get that out of the way, you'll start paying attention to dialects and trying to say things. might not apply exactly to that, but if you want to learn how to do something, work wood, program, do something, and you put it in the form of a project, you want to be a painter, so you pick a painting you want to paint. It might go a little something like this. I divide up all projects in my life, 40, 50, 9, and 1, equaling 100%. The first 40% is called the fun 40. Why is it called the fun 40? Back in my video game days, when we would design a video game, we'd sit around and eat pizza and whatever we're doing, and we'd design a game. We're just running our mouths, right? Whoa, it'd be great to do this. Oh, we should totally do that. This, you know, that game doesn't have this, da, da, da. We're just basically brainstorming what we want to do. The next 50% of the project is where you actually get the work almost completely done. And I call it the Marathon 50. And that's where you're going to find out whether or not the people that are on your team really mean business and really have the qualifications to do what you're doing. This is you as well. This is where the difficulty goes from complete bliss of the fun 40 up into the stratosphere of like, oh my God, this is so hard, you know, maybe God's telling me I shouldn't do this. Just understand that every successful person that you've ever admired, they're waiting for that feeling of absolute dread. They're waiting for that feeling that says you can't succeed. And they get an extra bump in energy because they recognize what that means. It means you're almost there. Just keep going. Now, the last 10% of any project, I've seen this, I experienced this as an 18-year-old, 19-year-old when we're creating, in fact, I was probably only four months into my 18th year, we're cranking out the final golden master of what is now known as TurboTax in 1987, and it came down to my boss and I as the only two dudes in the entire building getting this final master from the developers and starting the duplication process, which we had to do ourselves with every single Macintosh we had in the company. But I call it the Brutal Nine and the Last Man Standing One. The Brutal Nine is a very important process, and it goes different ways when you're by yourself and when you're with others, but it's pretty much the same effect. When you're dealing with others in the Brutal Nine, the team, and I always tell the teams ahead of time so that people don't take away bad things, I say, look, this is when you guys are all going to start losing your mind. And you're all going to start losing your mind at a different time. Unless we get like a really critical bug in, then we're all going to lose our mind at that exact moment. But we're going to say things to each other that we don't mean. We might even stoop to calling each other names for a split second. You're not to take anything personal. Because this is what it takes to create greatness. Last man standing? Well, my old boss, Russ... And I were the last 
two people standing. Everyone else in the company went home. And just to give you an idea of how manual the world was in 87, we probably had, I think, like 32 Macintosh computers, no hard drives. And we ran this program called Disk Dupe. But the process was we had two guys from the warehouse take every single Macintosh off every single uh, desk in the company and bring it to the warehouse and line them up two rows. So uh, what was it? Uh, 16 and 16, right? I think I've even got a photograph of this somewhere in my life. Not digitized, though. And we would run disk dupe on all of them, get it started, and we put the Golden Master in and load up the Golden Master in memory for every single computer and then just blank disk, blank disk, blank disk, pull it out, put the sticker on it, put it in a box, pull it out. Put, we did this all by hand. The next day, of course, this continues every night, but we were the last two men standing getting this product done. When you deal with the project by yourself, that's kind of what it feels like. And I know a bunch of you know exactly what I'm talking about. You have done something like this, and there, your percentages were different, I'm sure. The Marathon 50 for you could have been, you know, the Marathon 70. But there's nothing like the feeling of a job well done. There just isn't. And that's sort of what I think the kids of today have no recollection of. They've never done it. There's no memory of it. The closest thing a kid has to that today is playing a video game and beating the boss. But there's not an adult there going, hey, Jimmy, hey, Sally, what are you going to be when you grow up? It implies two different things. When you ask that question to a child, it's one of the most important questions you can ask a kid. Whether or not you get a response or not, if you're able to ask a child that and get them to answer at all, they have to process it and answer it, no matter what they say. You've taught them that there's going to be a point in their life, starting now, where they get to choose what they want to be. And that's power. That's control that you've handed that child with that question. But the second best part is you just made them search their database with their limited knowledge as to what they might want to be. It gets the coals stoked and cooking. You could walk off and you still will have infinitely augmented that child's future. The second thing that can happen, it was very common when I was a kid, is the second thing the adult would say, and it, it, it funny thing is, the question would come from people that didn't know you more than your parents, because they didn't know what to say to a child, right? So it's this beautiful little paradigm that would happen, but they would say if they were smart, well, you know what? I bet you whatever you choose, you're going to be amazing at it. You have a bright future ahead of you. Just those little tiny words. Just take a kid's future and they, you carve it out for them. According to their own definition of what success is, at any point in time, they recontemplate the question. It's a big deal. I bump into people all the time because I smoke at smoke lounges and I'm pretty conversational. Some of you are kind enough to reach out to me. I do apologize if I can't get to you individually within a decent amount of time. If anybody takes the time to reach out to me, I usually always get back to you. As long as it's about something, right? But I do believe that in my lifetime, I've met plenty of people that haven't experienced any greatness. And I can see it in their face. They want to experience some form of greatness. They don't want to do what I do or what I think that they should do. But for some reason, there's not someone championing what could happen. The other flip side, and it's the most illogical thing, is I have friends of mine that have accomplished some amazing things, and they can't give themselves any credit for anything, which means that there's some external thing that failed that's unrelated to their business success that hasn't been satiated. A lot of times it's, I conquered the world, and my parents never said anything about that, and that's important to them. Their brother, their sister, somebody else, a girl, a boy, whatever it is. Their kids. I would say that the way to work this out is to keep going. In the end, you have to serve yourself and keep yourself happy. So celebrate what you get right, because it's you're your number one fan. 
I know it sounds all kind of professor positive, but it's the truth. And I'll give you a personal one of my own. I was always pretty capable as a kid. I made money. I was an entrepreneur from like the age of like seven. I actually sold products when I was between the age of nine and like 12. And then I moved to high school. I sold stuff in high school. I mean, it was like, I was always making something, programming something, doing something, right? I didn't really care whether or not my parents ever acknowledged me because they kind of had me and then was like, well, that was a fucking wrong thing to happen. I mean, they didn't, they didn't disrespect me or anything necessarily, but they were like really into their own lives and they were falling victim to a bunch of the bullshit that was going on in the world. This is kind of how I see it in my older age, right? But I think, I don't know exactly what age I was, but I must have been around 2008. My father came out to visit me to go out with my kid. We're going to go to Disneyland. We had a good time. And I came home. I've told the story like once before, but we're on the point. And I was just walking into my house in Huntington Beach. My dad walks out the door and says, uh, there's my boy genius. Something like that. Now, he has never said anything like that before or I think even after, right? And I was shocked. I was like, whoa, that came out of your mouth. That's crazy. Because I always, you know, he's very, he was very competitive with me when he was younger. I think he sort of resented the fact that things came to me very easily. That's just my suspicion. I'll never, ever be able to ask him that because he never gets serious about anything. And at this point, he's like, let's just have fun until you, you know, punch your ticket, right? So I have felt that weird thing. It wasn't important to me that, I mean, maybe subconsciously it was important, you know, or it was it would have been nice kind of thing, but he finally did it. And at that point, it was funny. It was such a profound thing of like, whoa, the dude who never gets serious kind of got serious for a second. And I'm good with that. Like, he never really needs to say that again because he exposed what he thinks about me that one time. It's not going to change unless I go become a serial killer, Right. So I know what it's like to have things that are outside of your circle be important to you. And because they're not happening or haven't happened yet, uh, you can't enjoy what you have. But what if I had consciously done that to myself, right? I'd done all kinds of stuff that was pretty damn impressive before I had my own video game company, which is when I got out of the car that day, right? I was probably five years in, uh, three years into that company making money hand over fist, really successful, really cool. But if I had said, woe is me, I helped create TurboTax as a young 18-year-old kid with like, I think four other coders and then the founder, and my name was in the credits, and then I went off and became a corporate database guy, and I became this internet guy, and blah, 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 and I did this, and I did that, and I helped the celebrity. If I had said, oh my gosh, my, my mommy or my daddy hasn't called me and said something, and I gave up, I mean, look at how much other stuff wouldn't have happened. We would have never met, I'd tell you that much. So, Sid Mead also told me this one thing. And he didn't always get into serious conversations, but he did give me one piece of advice, which I completely, completely believed before he told me. But it was only recently before he told me that I really kind of came to this epiphany. But he said, look, no one else completes you. You complete you. And if you don't complete you, you're really of no use to someone else, especially in a relationship. And his partner was in the room when he said it. And the thing was, is that the cool thing about it was Sid had completed himself a long time ago. He he fell in love with his skills. He looked in the mirror and liked who he saw. And so when he started getting to his... uh, relationship, which eventually was his marriage, um, he had everything to offer his partner. So we sort of owe it to ourselves as a foundational play to build our linear mind to complete ourselves, right? I mean, I could make a whole separate episode on that, but I think that's really the gist of the situation, right? Thing is, if you follow me, you have a linear mind. Isn't that cool? Seriously, if you're listening to me, I'm at 76 minutes. Uh, you're probably much shorter once I get rid of some of the sounds that have been going on around me. You have a linear mind. In one way, I would call you the gifted. 
what you can accomplish in your life is an order of magnitude over someone who's a now person. It's not a competition. We want everyone to have a linear mind. If the whole world wins, then we don't need kings and queens. We don't need politicians. We don't need gigantic governments over us because there's no need for them. We're governing ourselves. There's no mass murders anywhere. There's no wars anywhere. No one's unhappy overall. I mean, there'll be personal issues here and there. I'm sure someone will punch someone in the face every once in a while. Someone likes someone else's squeeze. Probably still happen, right? We won't be perfect, but by God, we'll be several orders of magnitude more peaceful than we are today. And that's why I don't like the competitive nature way of running the world. The Olympics pissed me off. Okay, Russia, you lost. America won. Oh, you won. We lost. You know, it's like, why do you think we have a bunch of old <laughs> old baby boomers that can still tow around the Russia Ruski bullshit? Because they've been brainwashed every single possible way they could be brainwashed and that they have to lose for us to win. How stupid is that? I think the linear mind is the fundamental key to intelligence. I know you have it. I know you have it. You listen to me ramble. Whether you agree with me or not, you have it. You can make it more intense if you want. And you can help others by probably even tricking them into it. The cell phone is probably the single biggest enemy of the linear mind. You may mention this to someone else and say, you know, I heard this thing the other day that uh, one of the ways the cell phone's destroying people's brains is that they're losing the linear mind. They can't think about strategy at all. Some people will go, oh, whatever. Did you see this on TikTok? And other people will go, really? Tell me more. And then they, you have the door open, right? Anyway, I know you feel me. If you haven't been to deepthoughtsradio.com, please go. Everything's up there. Sprucing up the website here and there. To the PayPal and Patreon folks, thank you so much. For those of you who've reached out to me and haven't heard from me, I have just been busy for three days straight. Almost no correspondence with any human being. It includes text messages and phone calls. So never fear, I'll get to you. In the meantime, take care of yourself and someone else, and I'll see you in the next Deep Thoughts. Over and out.